since 1942, and in Cairo, a small gathering of dignitaries take a break from the war to enjoy some simple stage magic. The man performing is Jasper Maskelyne, then Britain's most famous magician. His war story is one of the most bizarre you'll ever hear. In the months to come, Maskelyne will use all his magic skills to defeat the tactical wizardry of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. The Magician versus the Warrior. It's a tale of the courage of real soldiers aided by the black arts of deception. A tale of half-truths and misdirection. This is the amazing story of magic at war. Would you sir, come and do that for me? There was one particular trick that I could never fathom. It was a trick of two barrels, one on the ground and then in the middle was this steel plate and the girl was fed into the top barrel. Lots of fanfare, music and everything else. Then, hey presto, the top barrel was removed and the girl was in the bottom barrel. Um, I could never understand how it could be. And here is the little birdie in the gilded cage. But the best one of all, I thought, was my father's razor blade trick when he stood in front of the cloth while they were preparing the scenes behind and he had something like 12 real double-sided razor blades on a little rack and a spool of white thread. And if you'll pardon me, I'll just take my medicine. He'd do this with 12 blades, and then he'd get a long length of white cotton thread and swallow that. I hate to rattle when I walk. And follow that with a drink of water from the glass. Then, leaning back and always as graceful as an athlete, he would pull all of the blades on this cotton thread tied one after the other out of his mouth. In the 1930s, Jasper Maskelyne was one of the nation's favorite entertainers. And while Europe was falling under the spell of the German leader and war was becoming inevitable, the prospect of Maskelyne entering the ranks of the British Army seemed unlikely, to say the least. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm going to show you a little trick called ringing the rod. And I use a solid rod. He was very, very uh, much of an egotist. He didn't uh, suffer any criticism kindly. He overrode any sort of problem that he encountered on the stage. He was totally committed to his profession. We would go shopping with him and um, he would be at the counter and order something and um, suddenly he would reach behind my ear and produce an egg or an orange or something like that, yes. He was absolutely famous, really, because when I went to school, and I used to have to use the London tube quite often, it was plastered with these pictures of him in immaculate suits. He was just known everywhere. He was the original male model. There was my father's photograph everywhere I went. Fame, like magic, ran in the masculine family. His father, Neville, and his grandfather, John Neville, were both famous illusionists with their own stage show. They were also gifted inventors. 
Of more than 50 patents they took out, they included the coin-operated toilet door, the origin of the phrase spending a penny, as well as the first ever bus conductor's ticket punch. Original ideas must obviously have been in Jasper's blood as the third generation. He was a trained magician, but also with this inquiring mind and mind for developing new ideas. And I think this was very important. And as our old friend Mrs. Mock would say, can I do you now, sir? <laughs> But as Britain entered the war, this committed entertainer began to harbour thoughts about offering his secret services to the military. London prepares its defences against attack from the air. And was there ever a doubt that when the time came, the men of Britain would again flock to the colours? In 1939, he was 37, perhaps too old for the army, certainly not too old to be conscripted but he wanted to join the army and he felt that he could make a contribution uh, through camouflage. He uh, had ideas, he felt um, it should be different to the standard camouflage principles. There would be nothing standard about Jasper's war work. In his post-war memoirs, Magic Top Secret, Jasper Maskelyne would describe in his own words his achievements. I found myself wearing Royal Engineers uniform and swirled inevitably to Farnham to a camouflage training development center. For six weeks I had to attend lectures where I learned how Arctic rabbits suffer a change of color when snow falls and why tigers hang about in tall grass. Six weeks being told very elementary truths about the art of hiding things almost drove me out of my mind. I think I may say without particular vanity that a lifetime of hiding things on the stage had taught me more about the subject than rabbits and tigers will ever know. His short spell at the camouflage training center convinced Jasper Maskelyne he did have something to offer. He began to push for a posting. And with the conflict a little over a year old, he was sent to the only theater of war where British troops were fighting, the desert of North Africa. But any thoughts Maskelyne might have had of pitting his wits against the military genius Rommel were soon dashed. When Jasper Maskelyne eventually got to Egypt, he didn't find life easy. The officers there still couldn't see what role a conjurer would have. They felt that the best thing for him to do was to entertain the troops. They didn't see him as a helping them with deceiving the enemy. Uh, so he did a few shows out there. They couldn't understand how this conjurer could help. Contemporary magician Paul Zenon has studied the life and work of Jasper Maskelyne. You can understand Maskelyne's frustration about not being taken seriously by his superiors, but then you've got to understand that there is sort of a, quite a clash of culture between magicians and, uh, and the army. They couldn't possibly know what Maskelyne had to offer. Having got to Egypt, I found that I was very much not wanted there. The obstruction and dislike of the idea of military magic that I had met at home was ten times multiplied here. My name, which I had supposed might guarantee that I was an expert in my own field, was a drawback to me. The serious senior officers I met asked me to organize stage shows for the troops. The idea that an actor could produce war magic they regarded as ludicrous. Maskelyne had certain lateral thinking skills that magicians possess, which were obviously useful, particularly in this war. This was the first time that a new visual element had come into play, and it became very important what the battlefield looked like from above uh, by air reconnaissance. And strange as it may seem, out of all the possible sort of theatres of war that he could have worked in, then by its very nature, a big empty desert was actually almost ideal for him. The desert, like the sea, looks flat and featureless, uh, rather in the way that when we come into a theatre for a magic show, the stage looks flat and featureless and empty and black. And we know that it's not, and that all kinds of secret devices are concealed in the blackness. Uh, and we come there 
to watch Magic and Illusion. So, on the apparently flat and featureless desert, the art of deception had to be practiced. And that took magic skills, of which Jasper Masculine and the Masculine family were certainly masters. All the time, however, my mind was obsessed with the idea of mobilizing world magic against Hitler. War magic and theatrical magic, you see, are very similar things. If I could stand in the focus of powerful footlights and deceive attentive and undisturbed onlookers, separated from me only by the width of the orchestra pit, then I could certainly devise means of deceiving German observers 15,000 feet up in the air. But when and how would Masculine the Magician get a chance to prove his point? In early 1941, Hitler was tightening his grip on mainland Europe. In North Africa, Rommel began to make inroads. The tide was turning against the British, and some began to believe that Rommel was blessed with what the Germans called Fingerspitzengefühl, or a sixth sense. There were certainly British troops who, who suspected Rommel of having almost supernatural powers. He always seemed to be in the right place at the time. He always seemed to be able to second-guess the British armies. And they may have wanted to um, at least give the impression that they had some type of magical force with which to counteract him. The Allies' experience in those early days of the war is they were really up against it. Uh, and one of the reasons that they resorted to deception in a way that the Germans didn't, because they just had a belief in the power of the, of, of the Wehrmacht and their, their capacity to apply brute strength to a problem. Um, when you're up against it, you resort to other kinds of measures. Maskelyne was convinced he could trick enemy bombers, but his role in the army was still largely restricted to morale-boosting magic shows. His frustration was to be eased as the black arts of deception began to meet with approval at the very highest level. Winston Churchill coined the phrase that in war, truth should be accompanied by a bodyguard of lies, and this became known as the bodyguard concept, that for every real operation, there should be two, three, or four deception operations going on at the same time to try and mislead the enemy. And the best results that were achieved by deception operations in the Second World War were very rarely to convince the enemy of the deception, but quite frequently to produce uncertainty so that the enemy didn't know which was the real operation and ended up trying to defend against all of them. In the spring of 1941, the Commander-in-Chief Middle East General Wavell established a unit known as A-Force. Well, A-Force is a body that's really set up with two main aims. One is counterintelligence and the other is deception and the, the two go hand in hand and it's really deceiving the enemy in whatever way you can. They ran agents, they, they tried to intercept agents, they, they gave out false information and of course uh, the purpose of masculine and the, and the camouflage and deception unit they made it appear that, that installations were where they weren't or they, or they tried to disguise them. And, and A-Force ultimately came to embody all of these, all of these uh, different elements of, um, of deception warfare. Maskelyne had long held the view that if he could create convincing illusions on a simple stage, he could certainly fool enemy pilots. He understood that things looked very different from the air. It was a concept that the army was beginning to take more and more seriously. Little does the modern soldier realize how responsible he is in drawing the enemy airman's attention to his presence. And it is difficult for him to camouflage against the air unless he has actually flown, studied aerial photographs, or seen for himself the world from this new aspect, where lack of concealment or disguise stand out so clearly. Let's stop the camera and see some of the most prominent objects that show from the air. Look at these huts and these tents here. See how clearly vehicles show up. Remember this when next time you're parking your bus. Jasper Maskelyne could not pull off the deceptions and illusions he dreamed of on his own. He would need a specially selected team, men that could cover a wide range of creative skills, his very own magic gang. I was looking for people with initiative and ideas. The best soldiers often have to suppress these instincts so as to develop an absolute sense of discipline. I cared little for discipline if I got a genius. 
Eventually, I picked out 14 men. One was a leading London electrical engineer. One was a carpenter who'd never earned more than three pounds a week. There were some analytical chemists and a stage scenery manufacturer. They were the most oddly assorted lot you ever saw, and it was apparent to me from the start that those on the staff who believed mainly in pipe clay and brass polish were going to suffer very much. The importance of the Magic Gang vis-a-vis -vis the North African campaign certainly may have been underestimated by some people in the official histories. Uh, they were a wild and woolly bunch that in some ways had very loose discipline. They, they wouldn't necessarily have worn military uniform all the time. There wouldn't have been much saluting going on, but they had an important role to play. Ken Devereaux was one of Maskelyne's magic gang. He handed down his memories of the group and their exploits in the desert to his children. We were looking through some old photographs um, of when, when he was in, uh, in the desert during the war. And there was a photograph of Jasper Maskelyne stood in front of what looked like a furniture van. So I said to him, oh, was this one of your London contacts? And he said, oh, no, Jasper and I were in the war. I met Jasper there. Were you putting on theatrical productions? And he said, oh, yes. And he laughed then and he said, but not for our troops. We put them on for the Germans. The Magic Gang was the hub of a whole team of technicians who helped bring the gang's plans to life. He wasn't easy to get on with. He was a hard taskmaster. His favourite expression was, go to hell. If you didn't like it, it didn't matter whether you were a colonel or a private. Go to hell. That was his expression. And he lived by it. He was a handsome bugger. <laughs> a little moustache, you know, like a David Niven type of guy. You know, always, always classical, you know. We had us setting up tanks and setting them in various positions and I'd have to, he said, paint that, paint that one sand and so much black onto it. Then if we go out into the desert, I said, I can't see this being much of success. He says, why? I said, well, the desert's flat. I said, you can't hide in the desert. Even among his own team, Maskelyne still had his fair share of doubters, but he wasn't going to let his chance slip. He embarked on a long campaign of hide-and-seek with German bombers starting with a brilliant idea for building dummy tanks. He used to have a car underneath that became a tank and he built it up with plywood. When the Germans came over, we won't attack there, they've got tanks. And he had everything to scale, this was the marvellous thing. He had everything to scale. You had to get up quite close really to see that they, w they weren't what they appeared to be. It was only a plywood frame that was all put on the desert and weighted with, with uh, petrol tins and then put these nets over and they made it so that these telegraph poles that were sticking out were camouflaged in such a way that you could see it was a gun, or you, you thought it was anyway. Dummy tanks were to become a widespread form of illusion in the battlefield. Later in the war, a U.S. Army film unit produced this training film. It illustrates the masculine principles for creating a dummy tank. Beneath Jasper Maskelyne's inventiveness lay a meticulous eye for detail. He knew that dummy tanks positioned all over the desert would soon be found out, unless the tracks they were leaving were as convincing as the tanks themselves. And they had a vehicle, probably a jeep, and then they towed something behind it, just like lats, and the lats, when they were turning, um, looked like tank tracks in the sand. Ken Adam was an impressionable young RAF pilot during the war, he saw the effectiveness of the dummies and decoys. The people who thought up these ideas were trying to convince the Germans that was reality. And they bought it. The evidence of those dummies and decoys would leave an unusual and unexpected legacy.
Ken Adam was to go on to become one of the world's greatest film designers, creating the look for many of the James Bond films. But I designed a film called um, Spy Lutney, in which I had this big super tanker which swallowed up three uh, atomic submarines. Even by building this gigantic stage, I knew it would not be possible to build these submarines full size. But I built them, I think, uh, to five eighths full size because people did not look out of scale and so on. And I think their game, you see, here's a film audience, that's the enemy, you see, and you have to know how far you can go to convince the enemy or to convince the film audience. Jasper Maskelyne's next invention could have been straight out of a James Bond movie. One morning, in the dusty dawn, a dispatch rider roared into the valley. He carried important dispatches, included among which was a page hastily torn by General Wavell from his famous field notebook. The general wanted to know whether we could cover tanks so as to make them look like army trucks, not only from the air, but from close up on the ground. The equipment had to be capable of instantaneous erection by a couple of men, and equally swift lowering. It must be capable of extremely rapid mass production at a low cost. Maskelyne's main contribution seems to have been in devising very cheap, very simple forms of camouflage, uh, particularly ways of disguising tanks to look like trucks, uh, a device known as the sun shield. Maskelyne had made dummy tanks from plywood and canvas. Now he reversed the process, disguising tanks as innocuous lorries. Now, anybody could devise that kind of disguise for a tank. Maskelyne's ability as a magician was to do what stage magicians have always done, which was to find a very cheap, very simple way of doing this, so it could be used in very large numbers. Now, the sun shield, although it seems like a big elaborate piece of equipment, is once again the application of a very basic principle of magic that's used on stage. Uh, for example, any, any performer who does magic walks on, they've got empty hands, all of a sudden an object apparently appears from nowhere, rabbit out of the hat, whatever it may be. So the idea of concealment is to hide an object from the audience until it appears or after it's disappeared. Now, Maskelyne had problems convincing his superiors in the A-Force about the use of these kind of principles, but slowly but surely, by the repeated use of magic principles, it began to pay off for him. Up until that point, he'd been almost living in the shadow of his famous father and grandfather, but here he finally made an impact in his own unique theatre. June 1941, Jasper Maskelyne and his magic gang had established their worth. But he felt he could still do more to help the North African campaign with bigger and better illusions. And in the months that followed, he was asked, quite simply, to do the impossible. Briefly, the task was this. Alexandria Harbour, then our chief naval base in the Mediterranean, was being smothered with Axis bombs. What could I do about it? The principal assistants of my magic gang came with me to spy out the land. It was impossible to do much with Alexandria Harbour because it is unmistakable. But nearby is Marriott Bay. It is sufficiently alike in shape to attract a bomber pilot much harassed by shot and shell searchlights and fighters. Maskelyne, because of his magic, uh, knew how people looked at the stage. As a magician, he had to basically look at things as his audience would. And he basically looked at Alexandria uh, Harbor the way a German bomber pilot would. 
realizing that, he knew that he could create a false harbor, you know, some miles away, uh, that from the air would look like the real harbor. Alexandria was a clear bombing target, highlighted by the Pharos Lighthouse, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Maskelyne and the Magic Gang set out to create their own version, a replica of the lights and landmarks in the nearby bay. When Alexandria was blacked out, the replica lights were switched on. In his post-war memoirs, Maskelyne claimed this among his most brilliant successes. The official records, however, have little to say. The key question is to what extent Maskelyne was personally responsible for a lot of the things that he claimed he was. I mean, we know, for example, that, that uh, techniques such as camouflaging um, installations, important installations like harbours and oil refineries were used. We know that dummy um, apparatuses were put over tanks to make them look like trucks and also over guns. The question is, was, was Maskelyne responsible for a lot of these things? It's very difficult to say. Maskelyne was, was in North Africa. We know he was part of A-Force. We know he was operating out there. What he actually achieved, we can't be certain. When uh, Jasper Maskelyne talks in his memoirs about the efforts to which he and, of course, many others, who he doesn't mention, contributed, uh, to camouflaging Alexandria Harbour uh, and to making it appear as if at night uh, a nearby small bay was the real Alexandria. Uh, he is reflecting what was actually a fairly basic technique uh, which was then used repeatedly by both sides through the Second World War. Uh, but what matters is not having the idea, what matters is the quality of the deception. Uh, what matters is how real the fires work, how real the anti-aircraft fire that is made up of fireworks and cardboard works, uh, uh, how well the uh, buildings made of, of wood and uh, canvas work. Uh, and that again was the masculine magic skill. Now you've got to remember that masculine wasn't a professional trained soldier, he was an entertainer, a showbiz guy. But it's probably that performer's bluff that gave him the confidence to try these illusions on such a grand scale. You've got to remember that it's 40 years later before David Copperfield walked through the Great Wall of China or made the Statue of Liberty disappear. Nothing like this had ever been tried before. But Maskelyne's next trick seemed even more of a tall order. Then came a sudden order for us to devise something to help out the searchlight units. Someone among the brass hats had been told that we at Masculine's Theatre used to do a great many illusions with magic mirrors. Modern stage magic is composed of a very great deal of scientific knowledge and application of the principles of light and shade. I think I may say, without particular vanity, that Masculines know as much about the deceptive use of mirrors as anyone in the world. He was trying to hide the Suez Canal. It's a major supply route for the Allied forces, and it connected together the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, and it's a thin ribbon, some places only a thousand yards wide, but about 120 miles long. So it was a very difficult target to hit, a, a thin ribbon arcing through the desert, um, and not visible very easily from the air, especially at night. What he did was he took a normal searchlight, and he bolted onto the front of it a cone, and he bolted a whole set of mirrors onto the side of the cone. And uh, then he spanned the cone around the center of the searchlight, which meant there was a cartwheel of these beams fanning out in the sky. Anybody flying into those beams would just get the experience of a slice of light coming across their eyes. It was something like uh, uh, nine miles across the, this cartwheel of beams at the maximum height. So he was trying to string together all these nine mile wide cones of light so that they would uh, mask the presence of the Suez Canal. But he of course wouldn't want to put the, la the uh, searchlights along the edge of the Suez Canal because that easily gives away the position. So they had to stagger the searchlights around. But the amount of light that they had seems to be very doable, it seems technically feasible. If you make a, a bright flash of light where all of the energy is in less than a hundredth of a second, then that's a very effective way of attacking the eye. Now, he was a stage magician. He used misdirection as part of his craft. And, in fact, the human reflex is always about 100 milliseconds. 
so he was very used to that time scale, used to misdirecting people in the blink of an eye. It was a brilliant idea, but ever the illusionist, it's impossible now to uncover exactly how successful masculine searchlights really were. Masculine in his own memoirs uh, is very typical of the kind of memoirs you get written by a number of people involved, particularly in the Second World War, who had rather unusual jobs uh, and who end up rather writing how I won the war single-handedly. Uh, Maskelyne is a theatrical person. He's a very vivid writer, and you're not actually under oath when writing your own memoirs. Official records throw little light on Jasper Maskelyne's claims to have hidden the Suez Canal. But there was no doubt that his skills would soon play a vital role in the desert's most decisive battle. In the summer of 1942, the British forces at Tobruk surrendered. The war in the desert had reached a stalemate and the British troops retreated to a new position. It was the narrowest line of defense in the region, running from impassable salt flats in the south up to the coast at El Alamein. Montgomery was now in charge, and he began building for what he believed would be a decisive strike against Rommel. His plan would see Jasper Maskelyne's skills put to work in one of the most important battles of the war. The Battle of Alamein was the last great imperial battle. It was the last time that a British Imperial Army, uh, without American troops, would be led into battle by a British general in the Second World War. And that meant that politically for the British, it was very important indeed that they should win a decisive victory. So there was a lot riding on the Battle of Alamein, much more so than a simple military battle. Both sides knew in reality that the British were going to attack at Alamein, and the only real deception that the British could mount was where they would attack and when they would attack. And those were the two critical issues of the deception plan codenamed Operation Bertram. Well, Operation Bertram was, was really an attempt to make the Germans think that the focus of the El Alamein attack was, was coming much further south than, than it actually was. If they if they believed this, of course, they would move a lot of their troops further south, and when the attack came in as it did, a more northerly axis, um, it was likely to be more successful, and, and that's how it ult ultimately proved. And the way the Allies achieved this was by setting up, effectively, a dummy army further to the south, and they did this by creating dummy tanks, dummy guns, dummy oil pipelines, a whole army sitting there, but not actually there. It was an illusion. Before Alamein, though all sorts of minor improvements and adjustments in design had to be thought out, most of the work was just mass production of tricks and swindles and devices, intended to bewilder and mislead the crop-headed Axis commanders who clustered round the bitter and arid genius of Rommel. Now, I saw dusty convoys of desert magic rolling westward, crawling across the infinite sandy wastes like a prehistoric dragon, I did not know whether to be overjoyed that stage magicians had been able to produce such enormities or to hide my face in despair because my art was turning prostitute to dusty death. Now this is where Jasper Maskelyne's work comes in. About 2,000 dummy vehicles were built up on the southern part of the Alamein battlefield uh, using uh, dummy tanks to create an illusion of a massed armoured force in the south. Uh, at the same time, about a thousand uh, sun shields were used to disguise the build-up of armour in the north. And there were a number of very, very simple things that could be done uh, to improve on this, which Maskell and his people developed. If we were going to mount a major offensive in the south, we would need very large amounts of water for the troops and a pipeline to supply them.
lot of petrol cans that have been cut open and filled with sand. And then the next morning, you would find that they'd been moved up and that hole would be all filled in. Their cameras would photograph it. They could see this trench being dug, the pipe put in it, filled in and then moved along to the next section. And the Germans calculated that it would not be completed until approximately the first or second week of November. And Rommel went on sick leave at the end of September, confident that the British would not attack until early November and he had plenty of time to return. The plan was working well, but for Maskelyne there was yet more room for improving his illusions. He'd already given the dummy tanks their dummy tracks, but now he wanted the German observers to see them fire. One of the things that you're going to be good at if you're a conjurer is puffs of smoke. And uh, what you required for Maskelyne's gun flash recipe were four teaspoons of black powder, six dessert spoons of aluminium powder, one teaspoon of iron filings. And the first provided the smoke, the second the flash, and the third the red flame. So here's another great example. You've got a masculine who would have been applying smoke flash technology to his tricks in Drury Lane in the 30s, now using precisely those same skills to make guns look real in an enormously important context for dummy guns before the Battle of Al Alamein. He could not afford to fail in any detail. If the Germans got wind of this, if they got suspicious, the whole thing was blown, the Germans would move their reserve units up to the north, and the British attack would run into a meat grinder. It could even end in a defeat, or at the very least, a very bloody stalemate. Uh, and so basically, this became his masterpiece. Uh, he basically put his imagination into overdrive. Uh, he basically built false railroads. He had false tank parks. Uh, he had false uh, you know, convoys moving around, uh, you know, false uh, troop encampments. They had sonic deception, sonic deception, um, which was, you know, people riveting things together and the muffled oaths as they sort of dropped hammers on their toes. They had script writers whose job was to write the scripts for the army units to simulate all the chat that an army group would have, all the, you know, say again on the radio. And these things can sound faintly ridiculous now, but they were part of, of an extraordinarily sophisticated attempt to use unusual people uh, in imaginative ways. And then, on the night of October the 23rd, 1942, it was time for the real fighting men to go in. Monty gave the signal, and every gun in the army fired. Noise indescribable. It blotted everything out, and the whole world lit up. When the guns ceased firing, there's that deathly hush. And I said, right behind me, almost at my shoulder, this pipe had struck up. And then the infantry went through. flashes winking and spitting in unending thousands and the better part of the German gunners and bombers smashing and blasting away at our cardboard, canvas and fustian while the real British armour tore through elsewhere and on to the distant west. The British attack started at 9.40 in the evening on the 23rd of October. Rommel was not even alerted to return to North Africa until 24 hours later and he didn't arrive on the battlefield until the 26th of October. 
Now, we can't know what difference his absence from the battlefield at the start of the battle made, uh, but given his abilities and reputation, it's most unlikely it made things better for the Germans. Uh, and that is the nature of deception plans, that it is often very hard to say, even after the event, precisely what their contribution was. Well, I think this was his finest hour, literally, because those tanks were disguised as trucks, and the trucks were disguised as tanks. And uh, if ever there was a time and a place where he was successful in camouflage, it was that one. That was his, his best uh, operation. And even Churchill mentioned it after it was all over. Now, while I do not want to detain the house too long, I must say one word about surprise and strategy. By a marvelous system of camouflage, complete tactical surprise was achieved in the desert. Uh, the enemy suspected, indeed you, that an attack was impending, but when and where and how it was coming uh, was hidden from him. It was the first British victory of the war and the beginning of the end of the desert campaign. For the Magic Gang, it was time to pack up and go home. The process of packing up began. Familiar faces vanished overnight, not because of casualties in the old way, and not to be replaced with new drafts. The crazy gang of stage magicians, scene painters, artists, electricians, architects, picture restorers and others, surely one of the most mixed and unexpected assemblies of soldiers who ever gathered for a united purpose, began to break up. Back home, Jasper Maskelin felt he never really got the personal recognition he deserved. Other than the basic campaign medals that were handed out to all soldiers, he was never decorated. Jasper Maskelin, this simple actor, this performer, this idiot that you paid money to watch, never even got a word of thanks. The net result was that Jasper Maskelin became a very bitter man. He knew what he had done. Had no effect, they just ignored him, and he left the army as he came in. I met Jasper after the war. He said, I'm going to get the hell out of England. He said, they've sickened me. They just take you for granted, and he was very bitter. Now I'm going to make a rough sketch of a world-famous statue. With the war over, Jasper Maskelyne had little choice but to go back to what he knew best. But Music Hall was changing, bookings were down, and he was no longer getting to play the top venues. His wife had died, and he was becoming estranged from his two children. The memoirs he wrote shortly after the war may have been an attempt to boost his flagging reputation and to rekindle interest in the name Jasper Maskelyne, the once great illusionist. I think he would like to be recognized. He would want the recognition that he never got, and it would have been devastating to him after the war to find that magic had faded out of existence and there was nothing left for him in England. Bitter and disillusioned, Jasper Maskelin emigrated to Kenya. In Nairobi, he set up the Maskelin Driving School and also worked as a special constable for the police. I think a good man, a very clever man, who went wrong. Ultimately, I think he was just destroyed by alcohol because of the very last photographs I ever had of him in Nairobi, he was completely bloated and uh, he died at the age of 70. And um, by then, you couldn't recognize him as this debonair and lithe uh, matinee idol of 30 years before. methods like smoke screens for tanks could be straight out of James Bond. 
But there is still a place for old-fashioned techniques that masculine would certainly recognize. extremely seriously because the it's such a key factor of everything we do every environment in which a soldier works he's going to be thinking about his counter surveillance and trying to protect himself from the enemy the work that Mascalena and his, his guys were doing really has been carried over to today dummy tanks are still being deployed on the battlefield and although the modern equivalents of Mascalena's three-dimensional tanks seem flimsy and unconvincing affairs close up they have been used to great effect during the Gulf War, the Americans used quite a lot of two-dimensional decoys in one of their land battles against the Iraqi Republican Guard. They put out 34 decoys, of which nine were engaged by the Iraqi Republican Guard. Um, the, those nine decoys were hit a total of 11 times. Um, so that's 11 tanks, potentially, uh, 11 real tanks, which were not engaged because the decoys were out on the ground. Perhaps we've got a little bit more refined. We're more technologically aware. There are things which weren't a threat to him, which are a threat to us, like thermal images and radar, which is only just coming in when he was really active. So yeah, we've refined it, but uh, quite a lot of the, the original work, really, if you like, was, was done by Mussolini, yeah. And magicians and speciality acts are always thought of as the kind of poor cousins of the arts world, you know, the novelty turns. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, after an initial struggle, uh, you know, Mascalin managed to leave such a legacy. Uh, I mean, the other thing about performers, particularly in those days, is the work was very transitory. You know, you're only as good as your last show. And yet even nowadays, people are using dummy tanks on battlefields. So although he didn't get the recognition he perhaps craved or deserved after the war, in a strange sort of way, his work's still alive. The British official history of deception credits Jasper Maskelyne uh, with, and this is a quote, uh, significant and numerous contributions to the art of deception. And I think we have to uh, take that assessment seriously. He was an important player in the deception game for the British. Uh, the extent to which he exaggerated in his own book is really rather hard to tell. The point about deception is that it's a collective effort. Uh, it involves a large number of different fields operated by different people, all coming together to create an overall illusion. Masculine was an important piece in that jigsaw. secret history featured in this program at channel4.com slash history. Next week, True Stories gives an eyewitness account of the Taliban uprising at mazar e Sharif in November of last year and the brutal fighting that followed. More details on that in a moment. Well, next tonight on 4, it's Big Brother. And as Jade sniping about Sophie escalates, could there be a backlash brewing in the house?